Something that comes up is how to stay motivated in the face of so much hatred of men. I thought about this after listening to a couple of really good videos. C.S. MGTOW's interview with the author of Male Angst and Turd Flinging Monkey's Life History Cycle, both linked below. It's long been my hope that we could break the cycle of hypergamy, which almost 30 years ago I called the cycle of sexism. But after so many years, it's hard to remain optimistic. Some 15 years ago, I concluded that the only way we could prevail would be if a lot of women came over to our side and, like Karen Strawn today, actually became our public faces. When I discovered MGTOW on YouTube, I began to hope that we might have a real chance of pulling it off on our own. But then Turd Flinging Monkey and the guest C.S. MGTOW was interviewing put that hope to rest. Turd Flinging Monkey concluded that the human race is doomed to repeat this cycle, and Clive's guest said we would never prevail without women like Karen taking the lead. Well, bummer. So how can heterosexual men remain motivated when we're doomed to lose the war even if we win the battle? First, as Stardust noted, just because you're MGTOW doesn't mean you have to be celibate. And he's right. But what if you don't do dates? As those of you who have read Ayn Rand know, none of her heroes dated. They had sex, but they didn't cruise bars or ask women out. Well, that's romantic fiction. We live in the real world. Maybe so, but I still don't do dates. Years ago, a Seattle Times columnist wrote that he didn't find a relationship until he stopped looking and stopped dating. Instead, he focused on his interests and met his mate at a group activity. But this was back when video games were still very primitive and people actually got out and did things together. What can you go out and do? Aaron Clary suggests learning ballroom dancing. I think that's a great idea, and it's on my list. I've had lovers, but I go for long stretches between them because of many of my activities are solitary, so I don't get out much. Yes, I have tribal events, but those are mostly business meetings, and most of the people there are relatives, married, or they're too young for me but I remain motivated because I have goals. In the Bruce Willis comedy, Hudson Hawk, the evil villain says, quote, happiness comes from the achievement of goals. It's just that when you've made your first billion by the age of 19, it's hard to keep coming up with new ones. But now, finally, I've got myself a new goal, world domination, close quote. No, I'm not intent on world domination. If I were a mouse, I'd be pinky and not the brain. But I do want to make a difference. I want to shape the culture to change our future. So at age 62, I'm still working on making my first billion. Only $999.9999 million more to go. But there's more to life than shaping the future, making money, or even world domination. What would motivate you? What about group activities? After high school, I tried being a Christian. During that time, I participated in a lot of group activities, hiking, skiing, and things like that. Just because MGTOW is primarily focused on the web doesn't mean you can't create real-time communities based on shared interests. I'm not talking about conferences like the not-very-successful efforts of A Voice for Men. AVFM is trying to be the center of a movement, and like everybody else who has tried to dominate the manosphere, it looks to me like they're failing. They keep trying to run to get out in front of different parades and seem to be making a lot more enemies than friends in the process. And while it's tempting to call MGTOW movement, it seems to me that it's more of a consciousness anyway. So while I would not be opposed to MGTOW gatherings that focus on men's rights or anti-feminism or things like that, I'd suggest that anybody who tries to organize MGTOW gatherings could be successful by focusing on fun and self-improvement and expanding horizons. Please forgive me if I'm covering ground that others have already covered. So what sort of things? Well, instead of making fun of the people he calls MGTOW, who are mostly young, very intelligent men immersed in red pill rage, if I were Aaron Clary, I'd be reaching out to them. This morning, I spent almost an hour listening to the best Aaron Clary video I've ever heard from him called Getting Young Men Interested in Conservatism. It was a speech he gave to a conservative group, hence the focus, but almost everything he said was applicable to MGTOW. Now, I know a lot of you guys in the MGTOW community are pissed at Aaron because he makes fun of what he calls Virgin Tau, and Aaron, and he's taken a lot of pot shots at some of the senior MGTOW, 
but in my view, wisdom is where you find it. Aaron has a brusque manner that can be off-putting, but he's got a lot to offer. So while he seems to go out of his way to drive MGTOW off, you might consider ignoring that. Everybody says stupid shit from time to time. Well, except for me. Men also need to start internationalizing themselves, and there are prominent MGTOW well-positioned to help men of all stripes, from MRAs to PUAs to anti-feminists to MGTOW, to do that. I think Europe is a terrible place to go right now, but Stardust might offer workshops where guys travel to Germany in person to attend. See us, MGTOW in England might offer conferences there, not webinars, where you go there and actually spend a few days on how to move to and live in England, or whatever else Clive thinks that he could offer. Vention 1 MGTOW, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, could offer workshops on how to drop out of sight into the dark net. There are existing models for that. At Doug Casey's International Man blog, they offer services like that, as does Simon Black, whose Sovereign Man blog is one of my favorites. And while his focus on politics and his often snide tone seems to offend a lot of MGTOW, you can learn a lot from Burn Chapin's channel. Burn? Snide? Shocking, I know. Personally, I'd like to see the Manosphere start to build a big presence in the entertainment industry. Hello, Sandman. There are some good movies, and I'd like to see a lot more. Arini is an actor, and he might offer training to men in how to get into the industry. A buddy of mine has produced three feature films. He and I worked for a few years on a concept that exposed me to the industry a little bit, and I see a lot of opportunities for us there. From where I sit, guys, it's not that there is nothing we can do, but that there is so much we can do that sometimes I virtually feel overwhelmed by the sheer amount of work to be done. One of my favorite books is The Shockwave Writer by John Bruner. The book was inspired by Alvin Toffler's book, Future Shock. Yes, these are both old. The main character is a software engineer who uses his expertise with computers to remain free in a world dominated by corporate elites. Well, we live in that world now, and there are people who, like the shockwave writer, are already doing it. It's been decades since I read the book, but as I recall in the story, the corporate oligarchs use fake public opinion polls to influence public opinions, and in the process of trying to stay ahead of the game, our hero stumbles upon a community that has taken the red pill, they didn't call it that, of course, and exists apart from yet connected to the system. This community is like the Manosphere, and the corporate oligarchy is trying to crush it. I don't remember how the story ends, maybe it's time to read it again, but I think we need to be shockwave writers, because future shock is here. It's been pounding us with wave after wave, and most people simply are not prepared for what's coming. Charles Hugh Smith recently posted an article on his blog titled Why the Status Quo is Doomed, linked below. In it, he dispelled some of the prevailing myths about automation and creative destruction. He wrote that automation will not just continue replacing human labor. The pace of this trend is increasing exponentially. It will destroy more jobs than it will create, and our current system will collapse. Well, he makes some very good points. Doom and gloom is not for me. A week ago, Netflix sent me Tomorrowland. As with most Disney movies, it's an allegory. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie yet and don't want to know what it's about, stop now. Still with me? Okay. At the beginning of the movie, the world is doomed because everybody has resigned themselves to a dystopian future without hope. The point of the allegory is that a bright future depends on people with big dreams striving to make their big dreams a reality. And that's exactly right. People who are stuck in old thinking and who are pessimistic will suffer the most. Well, as a shockwave rider, you will be ready to ride the waves into the future you create with your hard work that you do to make your big dreams real. That's all for now. Check out the other videos. Subscribe to the channel for the Backlash at Backlash.com. My name is Rod Van Mecklen.